America Meditating Blog Talk Radio Show. We collect wisdom, hear stories, and inspire each other. I'm Sister Jenna. Tune in live from Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. I'm Angela Peabody of Global Woman Peace Foundation, and I listen to America's Meditating Radio Show. Hello, everybody. This is Alona Holland, a listener of the America Meditating Radio Show. I'd like to convey my thanks to you, Sister Jenna and Sister Gita, all the way from Omaha, Nebraska. I'm Ivy Hilton, and you are listening to America Meditating Radio Show. Welcome, everyone, to America Meditating Radio Show that was lifted from Lucinda Drayton's Bliss CD. What a talent, isn't it? And I'm sure that you'll be hearing a lot more from Lucinda in the near future. You're listening to America Meditating Radio Show, and we're broadcasting from the beautiful Meditation Museum in the nation's capital. Yep, we're looking forward to the opening of Meditation 2.0. 
two in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. So that's really exciting. So please save the date, October 14th, black tie event. Please no shorts or T-shirts, which we don't permit anyway. <laughs> but we're just looking forward to having a very beautiful night. So please go on to the meditationmuseum.org website for further information. Stay tuned. We're going to have Joanna Barsh, who's a director emeritus of the Leadership Development Program at McKinsey & Company. And she's the best-selling author of How Remarkable Women Lead and Centered Leadership, Leading with Purpose, Clarity, and Impact. So stay tuned for Joanna. Let's go into what we do best here on the America Meditating Radio Show, and that is to turn our attention inwards, to be centered, so our leadership and our purpose can emerge naturally and purely for our own stories. Breathe in, relax, and let it go. Om Shanti. The time that we choose to be aware doesn't necessarily require me to just sit and meditate. But even while I walk and move around, I can be in a meditative awareness, which is awareness of the soul the original, eternal, imperishable being of light. For a little while, I'd like to invite you to be present, to be here, and to be now. Allow your mind to settle in the moment, to relax. This meditation is about awareness. It's about becoming aware of your original and eternal self. It's about connecting to your truth. Let go of your name. And observe yourself feeling nameless. Let go of your gender to discontinue thinking you're a man or a woman. Let it go and observe how you would feel walking around without a gender. Let go of the role that you play and let go of the titles that you own. Observe how you're feeling as you are gradually letting go. Let go of your religion and put it aside just for now. And let go of your nationality and even the language that you're accustomed to. Imagine you have no name, gender, role, title, religion, nationality, or even a language. Ask yourself. How do you feel at this moment? And in this feeling, who would think of you and who would you think of? The Supreme Soul would think of you, and you, the liberated soul, would think of the Supreme. 
in this state of absolute freedom, I am truly who I am. A free, peaceful, pure, immortal, and eternal soul. Allow yourself to just be absorbed in this awareness. At this time, the world of activities and coming from your center to emerge your power into the consciousness of this definite world of reality. And I hope you enjoyed that letting go meditation, which is my favorite from Off the Grid into the Heart, which of course I'd love for you to get a copy because it definitely goes back to charity. Before we go to Joanna Barsh, who we'll be having a beautiful conversation with, I want to turn the lines to Sister Gita. She reads us something very special from her stock of treasures. Sister Gita. Good day, and let's take that beautiful breath. I am thinking of women. Of course, we think of souls, which has nothing to do with gender. But I'm thinking of the book entitled Four Faces of Woman, in which there is the traditional woman, the career woman, the modern-day woman, and the Shakti woman. And the Shakti woman is the one who uh, directly takes strength or divine energy from the Supreme Father of all souls. I'm reading A Strong Woman versus A Woman of Strength. A strong woman works out every day to keep her body in shape, and that is good. But a woman of strength builds relationships to keep her soul in shape. A strong woman isn't afraid of anything, but a woman of strength shows courage in the midst of her fears. A strong woman won't let anyone get the best of her. But a woman of strength gives the best of her to everyone. A strong woman makes mistakes and avoids the same in the future. A woman of strength realizes life's mistakes can also be unexpected blessings, and she capitalizes on them. A strong woman wears a look of confidence in her face, but a woman of strength wears grace. A strong woman has faith that she is strong enough for the journey, but a woman of strength has faith that it is in the journey that she will become strong. Om Shanti, have a pensive day. Wow, that was big. That was huge. Thank you so much. I hope I'm a woman of... Grace and strength. Thank you. (laughs) The America Meditating Radio Show is so happy to welcome Joanna Barsh. Joanne is a director emeritus of the Leadership Development Program at McKinsey & Company, and she's the best-selling author of How Remarkable Women Lead and Centered Leadership, Leading with Purpose, Clarity, and Impact. With over 30 years of experience in the consulting industry, Joanna has spoken about leadership at Fortune's most powerful women events, women on Wall Street, and delivered keynotes and seminars at companies such as Google, Microsoft, Morgan Stanley, and much more. 
Joanna is also a strong advocate for women. Invited by Mayor Bloomberg in 2002, she served on New York City's Commission on Women's Issues from 2002 to 2013 and serves on the Ginesco Board and Sesame Workshop. Today, we welcome Joanna to the air. Welcome to America Meditating. Thank you. I'm in a very meditative mood today. (laughs) I bet you are. (laughs) It's quite a holy day. (laughs) It is, and the Pope is in America. Can you believe that? Yes. (laughs) It's this the time. You know, one of the things that we advocate so much on the show is that meditation is not a stepping out of the world, but it's a bringing a presence into the world. And you are working on empowering women to be centered. So when we look at the word centered, we look at a woman who comes from a very reflective state of her existence. So when you wrote your book on centered leadership, could you share with our audience a little bit more about what that actually meant to you and perhaps what you learned from writing that book? Oh, Absolutely. It, it is a word that we spent a long time uh, settling on. And for me, it meant uh, living in the chaos of the business environment, family environment, just in your life, and being able in that moment to both reach the sky and feel your feet firmly planted on the ground. And all my life, uh, I've been a bit of a visionary, and I felt uh, uh, as if I would float away. But the practical side of me, once I embraced it, mm-hmm. allowed me to get things done one step at a time. And you can do both, and you mm-hmm. should do both. So the, the, the core of centered leadership is self-awareness, self-awareness about your purpose, about being in a learning mode, being connected to other people in a true and trusting way, daring to speak up, to have courage to do what you're meant to do, and also to be able to recover your energy, to recognize that you are not an unlimited source and you need to mm. take care of yourself. And that those five things <laughs> can be learned and practiced. And as you do more, what I've discovered in my own life is that you get more joy, you have far more impact than you had before, and uh, the people around you are getting tremendous benefits. Mm, Beautiful, beautiful, Joanna. That's something that I learned uh, these last two years. I've been in quite an interesting season. I really felt like I was God, like I could just give and just keep giving. And it was very interesting. The folks that would just come and take weren't always rolling over the investment of the care, the love, the spiritual support that was being bestowed. And I had reached my own point, like, I can't lead in this state. I can't be... Um, a, a spiritual instrument for humanity if I'm not restoring myself. And I loved when you were sharing that, you know, your head can be in the sky, but your feet were planted on the ground. And I find that to be one of the best balances of spirituality. Mm. I, I got a lot of flack from a Washington Post article where I don't believe in this emptying of the mind or flu-flu way of spirituality, and, they, and I'm saying this with respect to those who are really maybe soaring in their own spirituality, but if you can't pay your bills, if you can't deal with your relationships, if things right. aren't just in line, I don't believe that's working. I really agreed. don't. I, I absolutely right? so agreed. <laughs> You need both of these things to really show the power of spirituality. And I'm so glad that you've broken it down to, I think, something very practical. What was it that got you, you know, into your research on leadership and especially women in leadership? Because you've been doing it for many years now. That's right. I actually started in 2004. I turned 50 in 2003 and Mm. uh, thought that uh, my life was perfect. Uh, I mean, I have a... I had a fantastic job, a uh, husband I truly loved, two children I adored to pieces. I loved everything about my life, and yet each day I felt empty. And more than that, I began to realize that in my job as a woman, I felt invisible. And you don't know me uh, personally, but I'm literally five feet tall, a little bit smaller now that I'm older, but... <laughs> <laughs> I just assumed nobody could see me because I was so Aww. short. And, and you know, and after a while it it began to dawn on me that the things that I had in my life were not going to be enough and I wasn't a, a particularly well-read person on leadership, but I began 
to search, and my husband gave me the idea of thinking big. And often men give women that encouragement that really helps. I decided Mm -hmm. I wanted to interview leaders across the world. And in doing so, I realized that it's not about what I was missing. It was about not allowing what was in me to come out. Mm -hmm. And that, that took years of interviewing successful women to to learn. Mm, I love that. It's like uh, your song is sitting in you and the words will emerge eventually. It's like, yeah, yeah, your song emerges, how I'd put that. You know, what mm, you were supposed yes. to sing as your hit song emerged at the right time. <laughs> and I bet no matter what you did and I bet no matter how much you studied, it couldn't emerge until that time was right and you had your <laughs> aha moment, right? Right. Well, it took, it did, it, my my journey so far has <laughs> been uh, over 10 years. What I learned from each woman, it's interesting. I met these incredible women in China and Australia and India and in South America and Africa and Europe, the United States, of course, as well. Each woman that I met, I fell in love with as a leader. And I recognized in her a blind spots and weaknesses. But I, in the end of the day, thought, this is a brilliant and remarkable leader about myself. Mm-hmm. I kept thinking, why am I not perfect? I hate this part of me, or I made this terrible (laughs) mistake, or I'm just not tall enough to do this job properly. And it took years for me to recognize that, that these women were overflowing with optimism because they accepted who they were and they had this purpose in their lives. And Mm. the purpose brings both, you know, strengths and weaknesses. It brings both successes and failures, and you have to embrace it all. And only when I did that, too, did the light bulb turn on. And I, said, I think we've got something here. <laughs> well, you know, you can't change the world until you're able to change yourself. And I, I love when you were saying, like, in the midst of all the chaos, you could still find that there's something there. There's something about the negative or the dark or the chaos or the, the out-of-balance part of us that actually pushes the beauty and the power and the strength forward. I've not been able to decode that yet, but I'm sure one day it will emerge. Or maybe we don't have to. We just need to keep allowing the paradox that lives inside of us to keep unfolding that story. What do you think? I think it is the latter. I think that uh, learning to accept is probably the biggest, the you know, the, the umbrella step in the game of <laughs> follow the leader because... When you do that, suddenly you see much more, you feel much more, you relate to people without judgment, and you can help make change happen in a much more profound way. Mm. I I was uh, an analyst at McKinsey, meaning I helped solve problems. So I was very, very used to trying to put my finger on things and telling clients, here is exactly what we think you should do based on all of this fact-based analysis. We use that same approach to build centered leadership. But what we found was magic, which is a bizarre paradox in and of itself. And when Warren Bennis, who has now passed on, was on my book committee and asked me how I came up with these five elements of centered leadership, I told him I didn't know that it was a creative process and that I could not decode that. And he Mm. was a little bit upset because he had 23 (laughs) elements in leadership. And I thought, but, you know, you only need five. And suddenly I realized (laughs) you need these five to be, to go to greatness. The others will help you refine who you are and how you lead. You just need these five. Well, you mentioned them earlier in the interview a little bit, but could you just in bullets give us the five again? Sure. So the first and the anchor is meaning. Women and now increasingly men are looking to uh, live into their own strengths and to have purpose at work and in their lives. The second is learning to frame and reframe, to recognize that the glasses through which we look basically shape what we see and you need to change glasses in order to get more out of a difficult situation or to get to learn more about work and about life. The third is connecting. It's certainly one that I struggled with for years. And the fourth is this notion of engaging, of stepping forward 
even though we're afraid, stepping forward to make a positive action. And the final one is energizing. Um, I included that one because a woman on my team insisted that we include it. And I knew enough to value her input and accepted it. And now I'm so glad that we did because all of the other four both give energy but use up energy. And you need another source, a pure source of energy, if you truly want to make a difference in the world. Mm, I like that. Those are beautiful. Wow, I'd like to kind of put that online. (laughs) Because (laughs) it's true. I mean, you know, a lot of times we look at our own lives and we complicate it more by, I don't know, I guess adding the ingredients of attachment and ego to the interpretation of what you call the glasses that you're wearing. You might need to change that so that your interpretation can change. And I think we're making it a lot more difficult than it really is. We assume and what I've, what the model that I've used, uh, which has really helped me a lot, is to imagine each person in your life or at, at work as an iceberg where you can only see what's above the water. But indeed, something like 88% of that iceberg is, is unseen to you. And so why make assumptions? Why not just mm. ask? What are you feeling? What are you thinking but not telling me? Or what is it that you would like to see happen in this situation? And the more we ask in curiosity without judging others, the easier it does become. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah to that one. Wow. Hallelujah, <laughs> Om Shanti, Shalom, and all of those good stuff. So <laughs> That's fantastic. You know, right before we get to the closing of our show, um, balance is a big thing in everyone's life, especially today. And the acceleration of technology has definitely contributed to our imbalance. I'm sure you would agree. So you found that a desire for achievement and competitive success can urge us on, and often past our physical and mental limits, and you encourage a self-awareness to shift our mindset from managing time to managing and balancing energy. Why is it that we often overlook the need for balance? And how can physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual activities help to refuel us? I think we lose ourselves, I certainly do, in the moment, Mm -hmm. in the work. And particularly women often think like, I don't know if you're a movie fan, but I love Star Wars. We often think of ourselves as Luke Skywalker in our little um, spaceship you know, flying through the the canyon in order to get to um, the big starship and and save the world. And because we're so intent on doing that, we can't move left, we can't move right, we can't eat, we can't call our families and make sure our children have enough to eat that night at dinner. We just say to ourselves, lock and load, let's just get this done. I'm not going to have any life until this problem is solved because it's my responsibility. And when you feel Mm -hmm. that way, You give up all control over your own energy. Uh, And energy Mm. is, in fact, what leaders need to affect other people to follow, to do great things. What I learned from this, um, I learned from uh, two gentlemen, Jim Lohr and Tony Schwartz, who studied athletes and wrote about uh, recovery. Recovery is the one thing we don't give ourselves permission to, but we must We must be able to say, you know what, if I take care of myself right now, just like in the airplane where you must put on your own oxygen mask before helping others, I've got Mm -hmm. to be able to do that so that I can sustain my leadership. Mm -hmm. And there are four sources. There, There is physical. That's the one we all think about. Get a glass of water, go for a walk. Please get a, get a little rest. Ten minutes during the day will, will help. The second one is mental. Often, we are doing work that's non-mental and we're driven to try to do something uh, mental in order to just refresh our curiosity. The third is emotional. If we're working in a solitary way, we need connection as human beings. And so that will give us energy. And the fourth one, I was the most surprised to find, but it's true, which is spiritual. It doesn't have to be Mm. religious, as you know better than I. It can mm-hmm. come through poetry, through music, through meditation and mindfulness practice. Um, mm-hmm. Without that, you know, the, the, the physical will wear us down. We need right. all four. 
beautiful. Joanna, it's been wonderful having you on the air and um, having our own aha moments, I'm sure, in our own conversation together. Mm. And um, if you're ever in the nation's capital, please come by and conduct a gift of your talents at the Meditation Museum. We'd love to facilitate that. Oh, thank you so much. Share with our listeners your favorite life quote that you're living by currently, <laughs> and where can we find more information about Joanna? Sh- sure. You know, we teach uh, leadership through great people like Nelson Mandela, and through his speeches, I discovered Marianne Williamson, obviously known to many. And the one thing, the one uh, piece of word poetry that she wrote that just has blown me away is that our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate, and I always thought that I was. But she writes, our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And particularly for women, we often keep our power hidden, and it takes a huge amount of energy to suppress it. And only when we release it in love, in lightness, can we in fact create the changes that we want to see. And I thought that my power was dark. And so today I tried to remind myself what she says. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. That's very touching, very beautiful. I was just with Marianne at Oprah's home for dinner last week, so I know how powerful that reads. Joanna, thank you so very much, and wishing you continued success and beauty in your work. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it today on the holiest of holy days. Beautiful. Take good care now. So steps can be easy towards our transformation, folks. It doesn't have to be, you know, rocket science to get to a place of our own personal transformation and internal awareness, as Joanna Barsh just shared. And you know what? It You can be waiting around or reading and studying or with some of the greatest sages or gurus or pundits or priest in your whole life. But, you know, when that moment of wisdom hits, that moment of silence, aha, there goes the unfolding. And so I'm wishing you many ahas and many unfoldings. And we thank you for joining us on the air regularly and making us your station, your radio to come to, rather, your show to come to, where you can take away something very valuable on your journey and on your travels. It is our intention to purely elevate you and bring us all together at a platform of love, respect, and virtues so that our humanity can be a place where we transfer those billions and trillions of dollars that we use for war into building a golden age at paradise. We're going to end today's conversation by Kristen Hoffman with love and gratitude. Remember, no one can take away your happiness unless you give them permission. And we are here to love each other the same. Take care, everyone.
Sol de 